Ever think you lost something and then you search all over only to discover that it was in your pocket? <laughs> this is me in car keys. And this is especially me in car keys in the winter because when I wear my winter coats, they have lots of pockets. And so inevitably, we get out of the car, I reach in my pocket, no key. So then I do the pat down thing and then eventually we go back in the house and I check the, you know, the desk and the cupboards and drawers and then Christy gets out of the car and comes back in and then she says annoying things like, did you check your pockets? And I say, of course I checked my pockets, that's why we're in here. And then we look some more till we run out of things and then I check my pockets again. And then I find my keys in my pocket. <laughs> And Christy is um, Christy's a saint. She does not usually say anything at that point. We just look at each other and we know. Um, I had everything I needed the whole time. And I was even annoyed when someone told me where to look for it. A lot of Christians are in a self-imposed prison of unforgiveness. And they've got no business being there. We're going to return to the Gospel of Matthew this week and for the next couple of weeks as we continue to try and see if maybe we can get close to finishing it this year. Nope. Today's passage um, will tell you to check your pockets. And I'm hoping that we can be patient together as we revisit some things that you probably know but might need to have a fresh look at. No, we can leave it there. So let me just, let's, you can go back to the last one. Yeah. So just, let's read through the passage. We're in Matthew 18. If you remember before Christmas, that's where we were. This is the next passage. So we're just jumping back in. Matthew 18, verses 21 through 35. So here's a familiar story. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payments to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. You should, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant? as I had mercy on you. And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. All right, now we'll bump through these. Is this not going to work? I don't think so. So we're back in Matthew. I do want to just kind of recap because it's been you know, over a month almost two months, two, uh, maybe a little more than two since we've been in here. Um, so where are we and why, why is this story jumping in? You know, we've, we've, the overview of the book we've hit several times, but you know, in general we break it down to five sections. Those five sections you can click. Um, each covers different sections of uh, Jesus' message. We've got two main themes of Matthew. One is the gospel of the kingdom. That's Matthew's big 
thing. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, the gospel of the kingdom. Um, and as he develops that all along the way, Matthew focuses on discipleship. We've had these different gears popping out where we make observations on how Jesus makes disciples. And so we're seeing how he makes disciples as he preaches the gospel of the kingdom. We've got, um, you can just click, a prologue that just looked at who is Jesus. Um, then we jumped into book one, and, and these books, these five sections, are just clusters of narrative and discourse on common themes. And so the first one just looked at the message of Jesus, Sermon on the Mountain there. The second one, people's response to that in his authority. Book three um, was people responding to Jesus in general, those who reject and those who receive. You can click again. Book four uh, moved into identity. And that was chapters 13 through 18, where we're at right now. Uh, coming up after this, we're just wrapping up book four this week. Um, book five, we'll look at the mission of Jesus. And that's uh, chapters 19 through 25. And then the epilogue, if you will, after the clusters are all done, is just the story of, it's what wraps it all together. Jesus' death, Jesus' resurrection, and Jesus' commission of his disciples. So that's, that's the flow. Now, you can click uh, where that puts us, as I said, is in book four, with this theme of identity. Who are the people of Jesus? And we had some narrative with Jesus traveling around and some incidents, a lot of them having to do with what is faith and what does it mean to really be someone who believes in Jesus. And we had lots of unlikely characters modeling faith for us, Gentiles. And now we've moved into the teaching section. You can click again. Uh, chapter 18 makes up the teaching section, and it began with the disciples having sort of a dispute or a fight. Who's the greatest? Remember that? Who's the greatest? And Jesus pulls a kid in the middle and says, let's talk about how the kingdom works. And we've been on this flow then for the whole chapter looking at conflict and temptation and sin among God's people and what makes us different and how do we deal with this. And so it began with the concrete example of sin among the disciples, pride, to talk about the temptation to sin, talk about the lost sheep, the precious desire of God to see people restored, moving into the lost brother, a picture of re attempting and pursuing to restore people, even though it also talks about if they won't be restored, uh, what discipline would look like, moving us into this last section on forgiveness. Now, why do you see that flow? Because while this talks about forgiveness, it's part of this bigger picture. We're resolving the issue of conflicts and fights among God's people. And, and this passage is going to need to be married very closely with the preceding passage of this idea of pursuing somebody and looking for the repentance. Um, it, one of the points we've made is the reason I've called it the lost brother rather than the church discipline passage is the heart of it was restoration. Before it is the lost sheep and after it is this parable on forgiveness. The heart of this is to see us be a people of grace where forgiveness restores us. So that's what brings us in. So um, you can click again. I've titled the, today's message To Forgive. And I've got two, uh, two ways of saying it. The chunky one and the short one. Forgiveness is letting the grace you have been offered in Jesus be received in such a way that it changes your heart towards others. Or if you want to just say it the way Jesus says it, forgive as you have been forgiven. This is a theme that's here in our passage. It goes all the way back to the Sermon on the Mount when he taught us to pray. To forgive as we have been forgiven. Uh, so as we look at this story, I want to start by just sort of untangling a couple things, and then we'll make some uh, observations and applications. So the first point is this. Uh, there are, I would say, at least two kinds of forgiveness. And part of understanding this passage well is to get this. And this is how language works. We can talk about a thing, and we can talk about parts of it. And sometimes we use those sort of interchangeably. And And... We've got forgiveness being spoken of more than one way. Verses 21 and 22 command forgiveness without qualification. He doesn't say, if my brother does this or that, how many times should I forgive him? He just says, how many times should I forgive my brother? And Jesus doesn't say, well, if. He just says, all the time. In the following parable, while it does look at it, you have this example of some people asking for forgiveness in it, it puts the emphasis 
on our forgiveness of others being because of the forgiveness we've received, not because of them deserving it or have done the right process or anything. The whole point of it is because of what you've received, you have a forgiveness already available for them. So it doesn't stipulate uh, that they have to do anything to earn it. It's unlimited, unqualified forgiveness. That probably makes you uncomfortable just to hear me say it. But, in similar passages, if you were to go over to Luke 17, verse 4, you'd see Jesus telling people that if your brother comes to you and repents, as often as he comes to you and repent, as often as seven times, you should forgive him. And in that one, it seems to say there's a requirement of repentance for the forgiveness. If he repents, you should forgive him, would be Luke 17. And really, even in our own passage, part of why I took so long to back up and put all that context in there is we just got done saying you should go to your brother if there's an offense and you're looking for repentance from him and if you don't you don't go ah eh, whatever I forgive him anyway you get more people and you go back and if he still won't hear you you go to the church I mean this concern in in verses 15 through 20 very much so there needs to be a response for this progress this thing to move forward and then in verses 21 through 35 it just says Look, you can forgive on the basis of the grace you've got. You have to be able to put these two together. Because if, if, you, if you don't fit them together, there's a sense which one will cancel the other. Um, John Calvin, in his commentary on our passage said it this way. He notes that in the Bible he would say that Jesus speaks of forgiveness in of two different kinds of forgiveness is the way he words it. I would probably say just two different aspects of forgiveness, but not, I don't think it really matters too much. I think you even get a hint of that in our passage, because if you notice when we got to the very end of verse 35, he tells us to forgive from the heart. So the kind of forgiveness we're talking about in the second point has to do with something internal in you with your heart. This is a personal aspect of forgiving that goes on inside of you. But when we talk about forgiving a person, when we use those expressions, who, you know, say forgiving someone who's come to you in repentance, we're talking in a sense about that external forgiveness, the things you need to say and do with them in a process of reconciliation. That's a forgiveness that's between people. It's the whole process, including the releasing them in your heart, that initial and internal forgiveness, but also the communicating with them on the offense and coming to an agreement where they actually own some guilt. That's repentance. And where you forgive verbally to them. And biblically, I think you should continue with, with them then seeking to restore the relationship and rebuild what was broken or return what was taken so that the offense is resolved and put away. Because the Greek word for forgiveness that's used in our passage carries this idea of putting something away. It could also be used for just telling somebody that they're dismissed from your presence and they can go home now. You're forgiven. You're released. It's gone. It's a forgiveness in the sense that the issue has been removed and we can move forward practically again. So there's, there's more than one way, even in our passage in chapter 18, that forgiveness is talked about. Internal forgiveness is about choosing a disposition of mercy towards the other person. External forgiveness is actually communicating to the other person that you are releasing the offense so that we can collaborate together on the whole process of reconciliation. Internal forgiveness is a choice you make. External forgiveness is an act you do. External forgiveness and the whole process of re reconciliation can't happen and won't work without the internal forgiveness preceding it. If I haven't changed and made a choice to change my heart disposition towards you, we can go through the motions of a reconciliation process and I'll sabotage the whole thing. Every offer will be critically examined and picked at and questioned. And so maybe internal and external aren't the best words, but the idea here is that there's a forgiveness of the heart that's between you and God and a forgiveness of the mouth <laughs> that's a relational journey between you and the other person. 
both matter. Both are biblical. But they are different aspects. And both are rooted in the gospel and express its power to redeem fallen humans. I can forgive from the heart because of the grace I have received. The gospel makes that possible. I can forgive and reconcile with others and have hope for reconciliation because of the grace I received and because God has made that possible with us. He takes repentance sinners and reconciles them. So it's a gospel hope and it's a gospel work both ways. But we do need to distinguish the two. My, my experience is people pick either Matthew 18.15 or Matthew 18.22, but no, you know, we don't like both. I've had lots of folks who want to get that Matthew 18.15 going on and get out the big stick. And they don't want to hear about an unqualified, unlimited forgiveness. It's time to take a brother out of the church. Or we like Matthew 18.22. How many times? 77. And we don't want to hear about this discipline stuff. Yeah, don't, we don't do that anymore, you know. Just forgive them and move on. Just drop it. And so I think Calvin's point's really helpful. These are two aspects of the forgiveness of God, and both go together. Both are necessary. Because if you don't distinguish the two, you'll pick one or the other. And when you do that, you pervert both. Let me illustrate it. If I make all forgiveness an unlimited, unqualified forgiveness that we're talking about today, then you end up undermining the reconciliation of Matthew 15 through 20 because you'll never go to a brother and tell him your offense because, you know, it's already gone. I just forgave him when it happened and that's it. I don't have to talk to him and he'll never change. I'll just leave him living in a cycle of sin. Church. This is a practice that has been all too common among Christians and among churches. Churches have been complicit in hiding and enabling abusers because they simply told the victim to forgive and then leave it at that. We've got whole denominations embroiled in controversy literally because of this. That's using Matthew 22 to cancel Matthew 15. Matthew 18.22 to cancel 18.15. But the opposite scenario is possible as well. Many Christians have remained bitter and vengeful towards the other person. I have literally sat with somebody, just ticked at somebody else, and I tell them you need to forgive them. They go, no, I don't, because they haven't repented yet. I'm justified in my bitter heart. That's allowing Matthew 15, which does tell us to confront and does say people need to repent, to cancel Matthew 18.22. And really cancel half the New Testament. I mean, where, what do you do with Romans 5.8? But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God's heart attitude of love for us already being manifest in actions towards us, preceded our repentance. That's the beauty of the gospel. I wasn't born yet. I can promise you, Christ died before I repented. Before every last one of you did. While we were still sinners. We need to be able to forgive people in our hearts while still recognizing that, yes, there's a process of reconciliation that remains necessary. We can do both. The Bible asks us to. I'll let you click. So practically, maybe you need to pause for a second here as we dive into this passage, as we dive into this idea of forgiveness and reconciliation, and think about some of the conflicts in your life, the offenses that you've committed or have been committed against you. My experience, I've said this many times from up here, is that 90% of my counseling involves helping Christians who either aren't doing this at all that their issues stem from just a total lack of forgiveness or are only doing it partially, right? I've, I've sat with folks who would say, well, we talked through and they said, you know, I said, I'm sorry. They said that they forgive me or vice versa. But there was no internal forgiveness. And so even though we said that, the next time there's offense, all the old stuff comes back up, right? Because I'm, my heart hasn't changed. I'm still holding it all. And yet I've also, 
I don't know, I would say as, as much or maybe more often, sat with folks who said, well, I forgave them. And so we, you know, we wanted to be true to that. So we stopped talking about it. And, and so they never worked on changing and restoring and redeeming. You know, there was no process. It was just that initial, I forgive you, I forgive you, cool. Don't talk about it anymore. It's, it's, it's gone. And then we do it again and again and again because we never restored and redeemed and grew through it together. They've gone through the motions of reconciling, but they're still holding bitterness in their hearts, bringing up past offenses, or um, <coughs> they really haven't ever even walked through a process of apology and restoration. So the cycle of sin just keeps going on and on with no hope. How does that compare to what you're facing? As I described that, are there people in your mind you would say, yeah, it's still broken, there's still offenses, there's forgiveness needed. Today we'll focus on that heart forgiveness side, that first step. But I want you to hold them both in your mind and see that total picture of Jesus leading us to be a restored people to grace and forgiveness. He offers it and he calls us to it. So this is for us. This is for his disciples. This is for everybody. So let's jump in a little deeper and, and chew on this too. I, I've said this already, but let's, let's unpack it in light of the passage. Christian forgiveness is unlimited. That, that's the logic and really one of the main parts of this passage. Verses 21 and 20, or 22, um, as well as the warning at the end in verse 35, push us to remove our limits on heart forgiveness. When we're forgiving from our heart, it's unlimited. That's the major part of Peter's question. His whole question is, what's the limit, Jesus? How many times? Give me a number. And, and honestly, I think, I think Peter's trying to be generous. There's, there's some basis, um, at least I'm told by people who've read rabbinic writings. I didn't read the rabbis, but I read guys who said that rabbis say this, that some of the rabbis taught you need to forgive people three times. And if that's the case, then Peter's showing up and saying, seven. He's going... Okay, I get it, Jesus. You are preaching a gospel of radical grace, so clearly it's going to be more than three. It's seven, right? <laughs> he feels like that was a generous number. He's still in the logic of what's the number <laughs> and just figures Jesus will have a, you know, a more gracious number. And when Jesus answers back, not seven, but 77, he's not answering by saying, you're right, it's a number, but it's a different number. The idea here, and I know some of the older translations say 70 times 7. I think there's a good basis, and I'll share some of it on why it's 77. But I think the point was not the number, right? Because the difference between 77 and 70, or 7 times 7, or 70 times 7. Either way, he went from a, a small number you could count in your head to something that, it, I mean, he's not saying, well, so get a notebook, write them down. Because, I mean, there's no way I'm going to keep track of when we hit 78 unless I'm logging it. The whole point here was be done with the counting. That's not how it works here. He's using hyperbole to say unlimited forgiveness. So we'll, we'll more on that in a sec. But, but the point here is Peter has used this number of completion, and Jesus has said, no, there's this concept here. I want to see it be full completion, this unlimited. He's blowing it up, countering Peter's whole logic. We're not counting anymore. And I think the reason we're going here is, is because that's the crazy thing about God's grace. He's not keeping count anymore either. The point is that when you start limiting it, you change it from the story that God's telling through Jesus, the gospel, into something else. Just, you know, how gracious am I? Gospel forgiveness is lavishly more than we could have ever deserved. If you think three was fair and seven was generous, God does more. Several commentary, commentators looking at this passage in the seven and the 77 point out that probably this should be seen as an allusion 
to Genesis chapter 4. That's part of why we think the 77 is a better translation, it fits the illusion. Now, Genesis chapter 4 is the story of Cain. Remember, Cain comes and brings his offering, and Abel brings his offering, and Cain has pride issues. In fact, it mirrors our passage well. Remember the fight at the beginning of our chapter? Who's the greatest? Cain comes, and his whole issue is who's the greatest? God received Abel's offering and not mine. Sin crouches at the door. Temptation is coming in and conflict is brewing. And rather than a gracious response, Cain responds by killing Abel. And then God judges Cain. And Cain says, my, my, my punishment is too much for me to bear. Someone will find me and kill me. And God says, if anyone harms Cain, he will be avenged sevenfold. That's the beginning of Genesis 4, or into the middle. And then we get the lineage of Cain, which is just... Tracing the line of sinful people making more sinful people, and it's the spread of sin and death. And so it climaxes the end of chapter 4 with Sames, uh, Cain's defendant, uh, descendant, Lamech. And Lamech writes this song bragging about, if you think Cain was bad, check me out. He sings to his two wives, so we already know he's in a polygamous marriage, and his whole song is, I have killed a man for wounding me. In fact, I've killed a kid for just striking me. He's basically going, I'm, I just, I kill it. You think Cain had reasons. I just kill him for whatever. I'll kill kids. And, and you know that's his point is to brag about how nasty he is because the end of his song is this. If Cain is avenged 70-fold, then Lamech 77. The seven went to 77. And, and the point of Lamech's song and the point of Genesis 4 is to go from this sin of Cain in pride, desire to be the greatest, to this rampant, unlimited spread of sin and vengeance. And the whole point of 7 to 77 is not that Lamech's trying to measure his sinfulness. He's just going, this sin has got crazy. It's going nuts. It's just spread. And the picture of Genesis 4 is the rampant, unlimited expansion of of sin. And I've got the picture of a tree on the PowerPoint because it's like the seed of sin that we began with uh, Adam and Eve coming into Cain has now borne full fruit. We got the whole tree. It's rampant sin. That's the 7 to 77. And Jesus picks up the 7 and 77, but he's not talking about sin. He's talking about grace. Seven has gone to 77 in the wrath of God over human sin. Now Jesus talks to disciples who are wrestling with pride just like Cain. And he says grace will go from 7 to 77 too. If sin seemed rampant, unlimited, spread from Adam to Cain and onward, you will be a people of rampant grace where unlimited forgiveness will end the cycle of unlimited sin. <coughs> so let me turn the focus here. I know this passage is calling you to forgive others, but the reason we've got to get this picture is you're forgiving others on the basis of the grace you received. This message doesn't work if you're not receiving God's grace in the way we're talking about. So I focus on the good news this is to us before we talk about our obligation to live it out to others. The reason Peter shouldn't lock up his forgiveness at seven is because that's not how we are forgiven by God. In one of the books uh, I'd recommend, if you got a lot of time, John Owen has written an excellent brick of a book called On the Mortification of Sin. And it uses a lot of different terms to talk about our battle for sin, with sin and the different sorts of battles we have with sin. He talks about the fact that the condemning power of sin has been defeated in Jesus but the indwelling power of sin remains until our lives are transformed and we're glorified. And so, and, and because the indwelling power of sin is present, one of the other words he and other Puritan writers often use is besetting sins. And, and what they're distinguishing is the idea that there are some sins that we are discouraged to discover we ha may have to continually battle even after our salvation. The condemning power of sin has been removed once and for all at the cross and at salvation, but the indwelling battle is here until we're changed at Christ's return. And so there's a lot of Christians who can tell you about finding deliverance in one instant, 
from this sin or that, whether it was pride or rage or greed. And yet that same Christian can probably tell you that they have found in themselves a daily battle with another sin. One man speaks of being delivered from lust in a glorious season of prayer. Many more men have to daily pray for grace to walk in faithfulness. For another, it's a critical spirit. For another, it's pride. But here's the thing you need to know. When you're wrestling with sin over and over, Jesus loves you and is for you in the ups and in the downs. Jesus knew how long that road would be before, he first, before you first let sin get its hooks in you. And he chose to die for you anyway. God's forgiveness is not seven. It's 77. When you are discouraged because you've last, lapsed into a sin that you've lapsed into many, many times before, Satan would love nothing more to, to whisper in your ear, there's no sense in repenting now. You don't, you've done it too many times and God's done with you. He forgave you before, but not now. That's, that's what you struggle with when you're battling besetting sin. And on, you're on a repetitive time and you're wondering, you know, actually this might be sneaking up on 77. So you'll never be able to believe in an unlimited forgiveness for others until you receive that unlimited forgiveness for yourself. I think that some of us forgive others precisely the way we think God has forgiven us. Not much. We can't get into you having a lavish grace for others if you're not willing to receive the lavish grace of God. You can't get this on your own. Only God can forgive like this. <coughs> now you can click to the next side. In a real simple, what's the application here? Believe the gospel. You want to be a person of forgiveness? You have to believe the gospel. God forgives sinners. God forgives you. Maybe part of embracing the grace that this passage describes needs to start by you turning back to the Father and believing in, asking for, and accepting His forgiveness in some area that seems like it's far exceeded the limits that you've set on His grace. Because <coughs> as you pause and accept the fact that God still wants to forgive you, God still can forgive you and does through the gospel, that's going to set your heart up for the rest of the passage. But if you don't come to that, the rest ain't happening. And so that goes into and I, the, the third point, which is the we've said it all, all along. Christian forgiveness is based on the gospel. And I want to flesh that out practically for you because it, it matters. right? Our passage, everything I've said so far is, is a prerequisite, but, but our passage has as its application of these truths the idea that they should show up in our relationship with others. As you receive it, you give it. The parable is of a man who receives the lavish grace that we're talking about. He's experiencing it in some sense. He's experiencing both kinds of forgiveness, the, the repenting and, and the, the heart disposition. The master has a merciful disposition towards him already by verse 27, leading to the master reconciling the financial conflict between them. The man seems to accept it, but his heart is unchanged. Evidenced by the way he treats those who owe lesser debts to him. And this results in the prison that he thought he'd escaped still being able to claim him. He's there with a debt. Why is he held in prison at the end of our story? Because if you think about it, it's actually a shift. At the beginning, he wasn't going to get locked up. He was going to get sold. And his wife, and his kids, and all his stuff. By the end, I guess the wife and kids are in the clear. But he gets locked up, not sold. Why? Now it's him, and just him in the cell. It's not the same. And I agree with several commentaries would say his debt at the end is not his debt at the beginning. He owes a debt of forgiveness. It's 
It's about the master. It's, it's not about the master getting 10,000 talents from him. He owes a debt of forgiveness. You want the forgiving power of Jesus to run powerfully free in you? It has to be received in your heart. We're not saved by empty rituals or, or magic words or accumulating enough obedience and self-righteousness. We are saved by faith alone. And that faith has to go down into the heart. Grace must be more than a concept that you just nod your head to. It's a gift you receive through the conviction of your heart by the Holy Spirit. Where, where God convicts you and you agree with that, that you are a great sinner in need of a greater Savior. The reason I lingered on the previous point of our need for lavish forgiveness is that unless your heart is stirred by that good news, you'll never be able to forgive the way our passage talks about. And that's also the secret to the whole thing. Your forgiveness of others draws on God's forgiveness of you. It doesn't draw on their merit, but it draws on God's gift. It's based on the gospel. So you need to accept the gospel for yourself. And so at the same time, our passage, verse 35, is not a happy verse. We leave this guy in prison, and then we look out at the followers of Jesus and go, yeah, if you won't forgive, you won't be forgiven. If you can't bring yourself to forgive others like this passage asks, if forgiveness in you is locked up, stingy, and limited... This passage is an ominous warning. You need the gospel for yourself. Maybe you haven't accepted it in the first place. Maybe you've wandered from that first love and forgot the grace you once believed in. Either way, there's no way forward with Jesus until you return to grace and let grace pierce your heart. The end is a challenge to forgive from the heart. So you can click over. The application here is, is, is simple but, but powerful. When we are offended, we need to look at God's grace, not the person. Because when we're offended, usually the first temptation we have is to dwell on the offense. Nobody has to tell you to do that, right? We mull it over and, and we rehearse it in our minds and we dissect and autopsy that thing to make a catalog of all the offenses we can find in there to hold against the other person. <coughs> Creating a catalog of sins to hang over their heads and choke out grace in our hearts. That's a prison cell. That's the prison of our parable. You can get stuck there forever. We don't find the power to forgive in looking at the sinner. You look at the cross. I love that we're going to take communion right after the sermon. Because that's the picture. When I'm wronged, I need to look again at the grace I have received because I don't in myself have enough grace for the person that wronged me. I don't want of myself to forgive them. I want vengeance. And so if I sit here and look at them, I will just rationalize, justify, and defend all those thoughts. And I need to stop that, uh, that, that process of just staring at the sinner and winding myself up in vengeance and instead turn towards the Savior and remember the grace received. I don't have in myself enough grace for that person. Jesus does. And so when I look back at Him and His grace to me, I find in it an overflowing abundance for them as well. So how do you do that? Lots of ways, but maybe let me suggest some. You pray. You pause. Rather than sitting there and rehearsing the offense and mulling on it and getting ticked, stop and pray. Pause to remember the good news. Every week when we come to the table, it's a chance to pause and remember the lavish grace of God for you. And so as we take it in a few minutes, that's part of how we get that grace for others. We come to the table to 
find grace for the whole week. When we rise from sharing the Lord's table, we take from it a grace to give to our neighbors. And the most simple way to do this is you can pray for God's blessing to those who have offended you. Because He has the grace to do that. And if you look to Him, you'll find that grace flowing through you. And so I, I want to dare you. At the beginning of this message, I asked you to pause and think about conflicts in your life. Offenses you have, or people who might have offenses against you. I'm hoping when I said that, that some names and situations came into your head. Can I dare you to pray for those people that you thought about earlier in this message? I ask you to think about your conflicts and broken relationships. Who, whose names came to your mind? Because as you take communion today, Pray that God would be gracious to them. When you lie down to sleep tonight, pause to pray for God to bless them. Because I think if you do that, you begin to welcome God's grace to penetrate your heart, to flow through you to them. And that's that initial limitless forgiveness of the heart. After that, We'll see. There, there may be more that needs to be done in reconciling those relationships before they're restored in their fullness. Right? The other person will have to be willing to do so if it's even going to happen. There, there will be a place for repentance and all that. But I can promise you, while there might be more than this that needs done, there certainly is not less than this. This is the baseline of Christian life in a world of sin. This much we must do. The grace of God compels us. So you can click over to forgive. Forgiveness is letting the grace you have been offered in Jesus be received in such a way that it changes your heart towards others. Forgive as you have been forgiven. So here's our two discussion questions. And I'll let you, we don't have um, small groups running right now, so you just get to form whatever group you want with whoever you want and just take some time to discuss. But the first one is, is an opportunity for you to share some testimony. I think it is really helpful to hear how God's grace actually has already been reconciling relationships because it does and it has. So it's, I know it's two questions, but the first one's yes or no, so cut me, cut me a break here. It's one discussion question. <laughs> have you seen God soften your heart towards someone that wronged you? Yes or no? If yes, how did that change the way you thought about or treated them? I would just love to hear some of those stories. If you can say, here's a time where God's, God's grace softened my heart towards someone that offended me or wronged me. Here's, here's what God's grace did. I went from thinking this way to thinking this way. I went from treating them this way to treating them this way. All right, so give you a chance just to share some examples. Question two, then just thinking about the culture of our church and wanting to be, remember we said this whole passage is about the identity of Jesus' followers. So this needs to be our identity. How can we help the way we talk about each other in our gatherings be gracious blessing instead of graceless gossip? Churches are good at the grace, graceless gossip. No one has to help you figure out how to do that. We are going to talk to each other and about each other. I don't think talking about each other is wrong. It's how we talk about it. Do we come with this heart of grace that wants to bless, or we just got a juicy tidbit to tear somebody down? So those are your two questions. Go ahead and break yourselves into groups. Um, as you do, I'm going to head back to the back room with the kiddos, and we'll, we're going to talk catechism. So go ahead. We'll give you guys at least 15. It's um, 5.54 here, maybe 6.10-ish. We'll come back together.